Nothing can be taken from it. God does it so that men should fear before him. So what has already been and what is to be already has been. What we know is part of the cycle. But God is outside of the cycle and consequently he is the one who holds us accountable. God requires an account of what is past. Alright, so that's verse 15. Verse 16, Moreover I saw unto the sun in the place of judgment wickedness was there, and in the place of righteousness iniquity was there. So, he ends verse 15, which is his first, his, excuse me, his second pre-conclusion with God requires an account of what is past. Verse 16, he asks the question that everybody is asking, and that is, why does God let bad things happen? And in this case, um, he's going to go into defenseless people, but what we often like to ask is, why does God let bad things happen to good people? Um, Solomon asks a more honest question, because there are no good people. There are only people who have been redeemed and who have not been redeemed. And if we have been redeemed, we are not good. We are given the goodness of Christ. And so there are no good people. But Solomon is honest when he discusses this a little later in saying that there are helpless people. So in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. Now, what's the place of judgment? Well, it's the ultimate place of power. It is the power of one person to say to another that you were wrong and this is the penalty. These are the consequences. And sometimes those consequences are minor, a small fine. Sometimes those consequences are ultimate, death. So I saw in the place of judgment, wickedness was there. Where there should have been righteousness, iniquity was there. Iniquity, willful sin. But, verse 17, I said in my heart, God is the ultimate judge. He is the one who will require an account of what is past. He will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every purpose and every work. So within God's sovereignty, we will trust that he is going to make all things right in his ultimate judging in the end. Verse 18 in chapter 3, I said in my heart concerning the condition of the sons of men, God tests them, that they may see themselves, that they themselves are like animals. For what happens to the sons of man also happens to animals. One thing befalls them, as one dies, so dies the other. Surely they all have one breath. Man has no advantage over animals. All is vanity. All go to one place. All of them are from the dust, and all return to the dust. Okay, so here we have him saying God is testing us to teach us something. So a lot of times when we see the word test used, we think of it in the context of um, school. Uh, we take a test so the teacher can find out what we know. That's not what God is doing here. God is giving us a test so that we can find out what we know, so that we can learn something. Um, and so God has given us this condition so that we can see that in some way we are like animals. That is to say that just like animals die, we die. If I were to stop breathing for any great period of time, five, ten minutes, I would die. Some people can push that needle and they can hold their breath even longer, but I'm not one of those people. If I were to stop breathing for that long a period of time, I would die. My breath is like the breath of an animal. And when my breath stops, then I will decompose like an animal. I will return to dust. So there is, there is something final about death in this life that Solomon wants us to understand within the context of what God is teaching us here. God wants us to learn something from the way that we die like the animals die. Now in verse 20, 21 he qualifies that by saying, Who knows the spirit of the sons of men which goes upward and the spirit of the animal which goes down to the earth. So I perceive that nothing is better than that a man should rejoice in his own works for that is his heritage. For who can bring him to see what will happen after him? And so, here's how God, through this testing, according to Solomon, wants us to understand our lives. This understanding is simply this, that we die like the animals die. We compose like the animals compose. We decompose like the animals decompose. And what that means is that when we die, we're done here on this earth. We are finished with our work here on this earth. We can in our lives, try to do as much good as we can because that is our heritage, to rejoice in our works. But after we die, 
whether it's an animal spirit going into the earth or our spirit up, going up into heaven, our work here on earth is done. There's nothing left. David uses this very same idea a number of times in the Psalms. One of them then thinking about, and we're not going to look at the cross-reference because we're trying to stick here, but I want you to understand that this isn't a, an original idea with Solomon. Um, David gave him this idea when he, in his Psalms, said to God, God, I don't want to die. When I die, I'm not going to be able to praise you anymore here on earth. I won't be able to work for your glory here on earth. I don't want to die yet. Rather, I want to praise you and to work for you and to glorify you here on this earth. I don't want to lose that opportunity. And so Solomon here is following in his father's footsteps and saying, when we die, it's just like the animals. Our heritage is whatever it is, and we're done with our work here on earth. Now, here in at the end of chapter 3, and then in chapter 4 through kind of how far we've got in chapter 5, he begins to, Solomon begins to deal with things um, from a slightly more topical perspective. So let's just keep reading here and understanding that his big idea introduction has been over here for a few verses. It kind of is over in verse 15. 16 through 22 is a bit of a transition into his topical section. And then 4 and 5, as we've gone so far, are his, kind of his topical area. So, he says, Then I returned and considered all the oppression that is under the sun. Now remember, in chapter 3, verse 16, he said there was wickedness in the place of judgment, and in the place of righteousness there was iniquity. So he's returning to this topic, and he said, I considered all the oppression, how it is that the strong are leveraging the helpless to make themselves stronger. And look, the tears of the oppressed, but they have no comforter. On the side of their oppressors there is power, but they have no comforter. So he sees the problem. He sees that those who seek power often gain it, and then they use it to gain more power. And they use that power to try to gain more power. And unless there is one with great power who will stop them, who will teach them, or who will remove them, then there is only suffering for those who have less power. Consequently, in verse 2 he says, I praise the dead who are already dead more than the living, because they are outside of the, the boundary of that. Um, the, they can't be reached by the powerful. They can no longer be caused to suffer. But verse 3, he goes very nihilistic, and he says, But it is better both he, better than both is he who has not existed, who has not seen the evil work that is done under the sun. So again, he returns to this frustration that he has, which is, the more wisdom and knowledge I get, the more I see clearly all the terrible things that happen on this earth, and the more that adds to my vanity and the burden of my life. And suffer, the suffering of the helpless is an example of that. He's asking the question, why would God allow the helpless to suffer? Isn't he the one who's going to require an account? Chapter 2, verse, excuse me, chapter 3, verse 15, C. So he says, boy, you know, it'd be better never to be born. Verse 4, he moves on to another example. Again, I saw that for all the toil and every skillful work a man is envied by his neighbor. This also is vanity and grasping for the wind. Has that ever happened to you? Alethe was telling me a story of a friend of hers who entered a number of co uh, compositions into a writing competition. And she won almost all of the writing entries that she had. And all of her friends became angry at her and accused her of showing off. When actually all she was doing was just trying her best. And she got recognized for being the best. And her friends turned on her. Every skillful work of a man is envied by his neighbor, and this is vanity and grasping for the wind. The fool folds his hands and consumes his own flesh. Better a handful with quietness than both hands full together with toil and grasping for the wind. The point isn't to be the best, the point is to enjoy life. Then I turned and saw the vanity under the sun. And he moves on to another topic here, talking about a person who is alone. There is one alone, and that one alone construction in the Hebrew is extremely emphatic. This is a person who has no one. And this person who has no one, it is almost self-inflicted. Or it, it doesn't have to be self-inflicted, but it is probably self-inflicted. He is without companion. He has neither son nor brother. But he keeps working. There is no end to all of his labors. His, nor is his eye satisfied with riches. But he never asks, why am I toiling? For whom do I toil and deprive myself of good? This also is vanity and a grave misfortune. So Solomon says, even work itself isn't an end. Being a workaholic, 
feeling obligated to derive significance because of all the work that you are doing and feeling empty when you're not feeling insignificant when you're not doing all that work. That's not God's plan. And so if that's how you get significance from yourself always being full of work and especially also from being acknowledged by others as we need you and the work that you do, it's, it's extremely important and we don't know what you do without, what we do without you. So keep working. Keep doing all of this. If that is how we find our identity, then we are, right, we are wearing that rut in the ground. We are pursuing vanity and vexation of spirit. God has not made us for that. He has made us to enjoy our labor, yes, but to gain our significance from it, to define our lives by it, to exclude other portions of our lives like family, like church, because our work is so important. It's vanity. And it will only result in emptiness. It is a grave misfortune at the end of verse 8. Solomon gives us an alternative in verse 9 and following when he says, Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up the other. Woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him. Again, if two lie together, they can keep warm. But how can one be warm alone? Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Don't be focused on your own significance. Don't be focused on getting identity from, from who you are and what you are doing. God has made us for work, yes, but God has also made us to enjoy. And the enjoyment does not come by being alone. How fun is it to eat and drink by yourself? Well, I don't mind doing it. I like food. I enjoy eating. But God has made us to do these things, whether it's work or pleasure, within the context of relationships. And when we do these things within the context of relationships, then the enjoyment, whether it be labor or pleasure, is exponentially increased. Verses 13 and following, he goes on to say, Better a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who will be admonished no more. So he's continuing in the vein of relationships, and he's speaking of arrogance now. It is better to be a poor and wise youth who is willing to listen to advice than an old king who has become so convinced of his own wisdom that he will not listen to advice. For he comes out of prison to be king, although he was born poor in his kingdom. I saw all the living who walk under the sun, and they were with the second youth who stands in his place. And so people appreciate someone who's willing to learn and to act on the wisdom of that learning. They wanted the old king gone. They wanted the young man in his place because the young man exhibited wisdom, not stubbornness. There was no end of all the people over whom he was made king. But even this is vanity. Yet those who come afterward will not rejoice in him. Surely this is also vanity and grasping after the wind. And so Solomon here can, kind of concludes a little section uh, talking about the importance of relationships and how these things interact with how we should live in the world, reminding us that if we live just under the sun, then all of this is vanity. But if we remember that God is the most important factor in this equation, because he is sovereign, he will require an account, and he is sovereign over our times, then we can have a life that's full of good things in our work and in our pleasure. Having got to that point, he now gives us advice on how to act toward God. Chapter 5, walk prudently when you go into the house of, of God, and draw near to hear, rather than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they do evil. And we've talked about this relatively more recently than many of these other ideas, so I'm pretty certain you guys are remembering um, a lot of this. Solomon here is saying we need to be careful what we do in the presence of God, especially in the acknowledged place of meeting for his presence. And of course that was the temple in Solomon's day for us, although the analogy isn't um, A to A, it's not, it's, it's not you know, apples to apples, um, it still holds that we need to be very careful how we behave in the place of God's worship here in church. So do not be rash with your mouth. And before the Lord, don't make promises to him that you don't plan on keeping. Because God is heaven in heaven and you are on earth. So your word should be few. Remember the distance between us and God. Yes, God became man in Jesus Christ. 
to make it so that we could be invited and adopted into the family of God. That does not lower God. And that has not yet elevated us. It has given us the position of brothers and sisters of Christ, but we are still sinners here on earth. And there is an immeasurable distance between ourselves and God the Father and God the Son. And the only way to get there is through the Son and His sacrifice. So do not be rash with your mouth. Remember the distance. And then he gives an illustration here. For a dream comes with much activity, and a fool's voice is known by as many words. If you want to reveal what you are, then just keep talking. Instead, when you make a vow to God, do not delay to pay it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better to not vow than to vow and not pay. And so when we come to the house of God, when we come to a place and an opportunity of worship, whether it's here in church or with our personal devotions, our object ought to be to hear, to draw near to hear, rather than to use God's place of worship as a, a place to achieve something else, to offer the sacrifice of fools, to do things to be seen by others. Verses 6 and 7. Do not let your mouth cause your flesh to sin. Do not say before the messenger of God that it was an error. Why should God be angry at your excuse and destroy the work of your hands? For in the multitude of dreams and in many words there is also vanity. But fear God. And this is the first time this phrase, fear God, has come up in the book of Ecclesiastes. That's in the conclusion, right? This is the whole duty of man, that we should fear God and obey Him, keep His commandments. So the big thing that we need to take from what we've studied so far from the book of Ecclesiastes is that God has got a great plan, and He is the most important portion of the equation of life. And if we try to live life by removing Him from the equation, then all of the, everything that comes after the equal sign will be not, will be nil, will be emptiness, will be vanity. If we take God out of the equation of life, then life is pointless. Life is worthless. We need Him in the equation. He is the one who will hold all to account. He is, the, he is the one who is sovereign over all of our times. And in that sovereignty, in that accountability, He has designed life for us to enjoy. In the pleasures of our life, categorized by the eating and drinking. And in the work of our life, which can bring us pleasure. Because we can find great enjoyment in the fruit of our labor and in the labor itself. Solomon was uniquely qualified to share these ideas with us. And we must appropriate this message. We need to understand that God, in his sovereignty, intends for us to have a life full of joy and peace and pleasure. And that we can enjoy that within the context of obedience to him. But if we take him out of the equation, not just in our whole life. But if we decide, I'm going to acknowledge God in my church activities, but I'm not going to acknowledge Him at work. Or I'm going to acknowledge God in my church activities and my work activities, but I'm not going to acknowledge Him with my family. Or I'm going to acknowledge God in all of these things, but I'm not going to let Him have control over my hobbies. Then we have taken God out of the equation in a part of our life, and that part of our life is only vanity. It is empty. Everything must be done within the context of fearing God of considering his opinion above about what we are doing or what we are not doing, what we are thinking or what we are not thinking as the most important part of us. And when we do that, then our lives are not vanity. Our lives are significant. And they are given great joy and peace because of who he is. And all of that within the context of God sending his son to deal with this vanity by living in it and being perfect throughout it, being the complete obedient man, so that we, after having lived in this life, within the context, hopefully, of fearing God and keeping His commandments, we can proceed on to an even better one throughout eternity with Him. Let's close in prayer. Thank you, Father, for all that you have done. Thank you for the instructions in life that Solomon has given us here. I pray that you'd help us as we study this and as we continue forward now. Um, in your will to con throughout the book of Ecclesiastes to be encouraged, to be challenged, and to be conformed to the image of Christ. 
In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.